So, buenas tardes. Uh, mi nombre es Álvaro Huerta. Me da mucho gusto de estar aquí con ustedes. Soy profesor de estudios urbanos y estudios étnicos. Todo este programa va a estar en español. For those of you that don't speak uh, Spanish, muchas gracias por estar. I am a uh, professor Álvaro Huerta, professor here at Urban and Regional Planning and Ethnic and Women's Studies, so I welcome everybody. I am really happy to be here with such a smart and gifted group of students and, and human beings. Uh, Cal Poly Pomona, as I've always said, is a great university, uh, especially when they hired me. Before it was a good university, but since I've been hired, it's a great university. And today we have a great opportunity to talk about an important topic is immigration. Uh, so after the presentation, I'm going to pass around the ha a hat and I'm going to get some donations because I think I'm going to get deported after this. I live in West LA, so I think they're going to deport me to the east side, so I'm going to get ready for that. So today's a presentation has to do with immigration uh, in the racist era of Trump. And whenever I'm an urban planner and whenever I do uh, presentations uh, throughout the country, I always get asked, what does immigration have to do with planning? And this is by colleagues and, and students. And sometimes I say to myself, how did you get a PhD? Planning and immigration are totally interrelated. You cannot separate one from the other. In the late 1800s to the early 1900s, over 20 million Europeans arrived in the United States. They settled in places like New York, Chicago. And during that time period, the cities that existed didn't have the capacity to take in so many immigrants. And because of that, they created a situation where you had overcrowding, where you had poor housing conditions, uh, poor sanitation, and all of these things that I talk about are documented in a brilliant book by the late uh, Sir, Sir Peter Hall in this book, oh, Cities of Tomorrow, which, which I was assigned to me when I was uh, at UCLA and at UC Berkeley doing my graduate work. And in, in this excellent book, he argues that what we know today of immigration in terms of a profession arrives or is derived from that period of the late 1800s, the late 1880s to the early 1900s, like 1910, where millions of immigrants, from, especially from Southern and Eastern Europe, arrived in the United States. And these terrible conditions that they experienced and that many experience today gave rise to planning as we know it. And while he was not a planner, there was another excellent book that, that deals with this issue, uh, Upton Sinclair in the Jungle. Prior to Upton Sinclair, when we were looking at issues of food, food wasn't regulated like it is regulated today. So in this classic book that he wrote in, in the early 1900s, based in Chicago, he demonstrated or he showed where immigrants work they, the conditions were awful, and the, the way the food was prepared was just as bad. So a lot of people didn't even know it, but they were, they were dying or they were getting diseases because of the way the food, the meat was being treated in, in these awful conditions in terms of the production of food. So because of, that, because of that, then you start to have regulation, government regulating food. And before that, you have uh, Jacob Rees, who wrote this excellent book, not as good as mine, but his excellent book, How the Other Half Lives. He was a photojournalist. For the first time, he, someone documented how immigrants at the time lived in, in squalor conditions, how the housing was, uh, was terrible in terms of there were no codes, uh, there were no regulations in terms of where people lived and where people worked. So because of this excellent research and, and articles that were being written at the time, 
as documented by Sir Peter Hall, we see that the, the rise of planning in the early 1900s where, where it gave rise to the, in particular, to the American Planning Association. There was an earlier name, but that, that became the association of planners that, that we know today. And one of the issues that they, they, they were looking at was uh, codes for housing, because it, it didn't exist before. There were no codes. There were no regulations in terms of housing. So this planning and what I do with immigration in, as an urban planner has all to do with urban planning. And my question when they asked me, what does immigration have to do with planning? I asked them, apart from where did you get your PhD? Probably got it online. The second question is, why aren't you studying immigration? So this talk is focusing on Latinos in general, but more particularly to Mexicans. And because Mexicans have become a target, just like African-American men and boys when it comes to police abuse, have become a target of this current administration. But this idea of anti-Mexicanism that, that we're experiencing today is not new. It's easy to say, well, Barack Obama, the first African-American president, was a great president, uh, smart, good-looking guy, family man, and so on and so forth, even though he deported 2.7 million people, immigrants. Let's not forget about that. The audacity of hope. That's a lot of audacity, Mr. Obama. But it's easy to target someone like Trump in, in this administration and the, and, and the anti-Mexican rhetoric that, that we are experiencing today. But this has been going on for, for decades. So from the, from the mid-1800s to the early 1900s, when it comes to Mexicans, these two scholars, Dr. Carrington and Dr. Webb, they documented that thousands of immigrants were lynched in the United States not just in the Southwest, but also in places like Wyoming. And they wrote this excellent book where they document this, and they also wrote an op-ed in the New York Times, which I recommend that people uh, read. So when we think about African Americans, we think about slavery, we think about lynching, but when you think about Mexicans in the United States, not just Mexican immigrants, but Mexican, people of Mexican descent, like myself, you don't think about lynchings, but white mobs lynch Mexicans the police, the cops, the local cops lynch Mexicans, and also the, in Texas, the Texas Rangers uh, lynch Mexicans as well. So this idea of anti-Mexicanism is not new. Trump didn't invent it when he, when he came down the elevator with his wife and he, he bashed Mexicans. This has been going on since, since the United States occupied Texas and then in the early 1800s, and then uh, the rest of, of Mexico, the half of Mexico, in, the, in terms of the Southwest in 1848. So once again, we learn a lot in history, in class, in high school, uh, about the Civil Rights Movement. We all know about Rosa Parks. Uh, we all know about Martin, Martin Luther King. Uh, these are all great figures, and I'm glad that we know this history. But we, don't, we know little history about uh, the attacks against Mexicans in this country from the mid-1800s you know, to the present. For example, here during the, the Great uh, Depression that we were experiencing, not me, because I wasn't uh, alive at that time, but what the country was experiencing, millions of Mexicans uh, were deported. So over two million Mexicans, or people of Mexican descent, as documented by this book by Dr. Val Valderrama and Mr. Rodriguez, over two million Mexicans were deported during the Great Depression. And we're not just, we're not talking immigrants, we're talking citizens and residents. So over 60% of them being citizens or residents. And too often we think, when we think about Mexicans, we think about immigrants, but Mexicans are not immigrants. They, they those people, like those people, my people, we have ancestral roots to this land dating thousands of years. So I don't believe in this idea of, I mean, we use the label just to classify people, but I don't really believe it. I believe we all, at one point or another, have migrated. We're all immigrants at one point. I mean, we have to go back thousands of years for the indigenous people. But at the end of the day, when the country is facing one of the greatest economic depressions in, in, in the history, and this was also a global depression, 
the easy thing to do and to blame at the time, just like today, is to blame the Mexicans. So we're white um, Americans are, are experiencing unemployment at a high level, so let's get rid of the Mexicans to, to free up more jobs. We also see here um, a situation where Mexicans are experiencing exploitation with these binational bi programs, uh, one in particular uh, referred to as the Bracero program. Now, during World War II, during that time period, there were millions of immigrants, or even before that, millions of Americans leaving the farms and going to the cities. And then during the war, there were millions of Americans, also Mexican-Americans, uh, going off to war. So when people are leaving the farms to the city, and when people are going to war, what do we have? We have a shortage of what? We have a shortage of food. So what's the solution? Bring the Mexicans. So during that time period, there was a program that brought millions of Mexicans uh, to the United States, 4.6 million of them, my father being one of them, my grandfather, and being exposed to DDT in the process of being welcomed to the United States. I mean, this is the way the United States welcomes guest workers. I mean, what kind of guest is that? <laughs> what kind of host treats a guest like that? So you're dealing with Mexicans coming over to, to meet the labor demands of agriculture for the United States to feed the, the men that are fighting overseas, because they were mainly men back then, but also to feed the men and women of the United States uh, in this country. So we're talking about Mexicans here, 4.6 million of them, and my parents being one of them were my father, but also many of these also worked in not just agriculture, they also worked in like railroads, like in Oregon and in other, uh, another, um, con uh, in other states. Now again, it's, this is not just about targeting Mexicans in, well, not again, but this is not just about targeting Mexicans in agriculture, uh, in exploiting them and, and spraying them with DDT, forcing them to to strip naked in front of their peers. This is also about attacking young people, uh, like we see today with African-American youth, in the cities. So the Pachucos were uh, young Chicano kids that they had their own style, the way they dressed, the way they spoke, pretty much rebelling against society, but at the same time doing, doing their thing, listening to their music, dressing the way they want, you know, not bothering anybody. And we see them being attacked here in, in the summer of 1943 uh, by the white uh, Navy men and also the local police. So the, it's referred to as the Zutsu riots, but it implies that there were riots, be, like the Zutsu, it implies like the Zutsuters were the ones inciting the riots, but they weren't. Pretty much the Navy men came in and they, they, they beat them up on the streets, they were taken to jail, uh, and they were harassed uh, during this time period. So this idea of deporting of what at one point candidate Trump talked about like mass deportations is not new. You know, we see it in the 1930s, but we also see it with Eisenhower uh, during what's, what's referred to as Operation Wetback. So after World War II, the United States experienced economic growth. Because of the war economy, it allowed the United States to, to rebound from the depression. And it was FDR. That, that made this possible with the New Deal, New Deal One, New Deal Two, but also because of the war. So you're experiencing here economic growth in the United States, and you're experiencing here prosperity. Uh, we're looking at the, the rise of the middle class. We're looking at white flight from the cities to the suburbs. We're looking at transportation and freeways being built. But like always, there's always a convenient scapegoat, and that happens to be the Mexicans. So during this same time period, Eisenhower decided to, oper to, to deport over one million Mexicans, and this includes also uh, U.S. citizens and permanent residents, to, to Mexico. Now, this is, he's, they're de this is the contradiction here. I mean, there's so many contradictions here. <laughs> one, the United States is bringing in the braceros to, the, to agriculture. Right? So during this time, they're bringing them in. But in the city, they're deporting them. Right? So we want you for your, bracero means arms, so we want you for your arms. 
not for your ideas, not for your aspirations, not for your dreams, but for your arms. That's all they want you for. And then it's like, this, like razor blades, they're disposable. They get hurt, they just send them back. But at the same time in the cities, they, they, they have this campaign to, to deport them. And this is what, what Trump referred to as bringing back another uh, Operation Wetback. But for the Mexicans and also the Filipinos, the Chinese, uh, the Muslims, and, and other uh, ethnic groups here in the United States, the Salvadorians, uh, Nicaraguenses, the Haitians, now they're, they're being rescinded, their temporary stay here. Uh, thousands are going to be uh, forced to, to leave the country. Uh, we see that the ICE, the immigration enforcement, they're pretty much terrorizing our, our communities. So the idea here is that we're targeting the bad hombres, we're targeting the criminals. But why are you to believe that just because they say somebody's a criminal, that the government says that, that they're a criminal? Like, we need to question that in itself, right? It's like, who believed George Bush when he said that Saddam Hussein had mass, a weapons of mass destruction? So when you believe the lie, then you're falling into a trap. So the, the fact of the matter is that they're, they're deporting on a rapid rate, not as fast as Obama, he pretty much has a record, but they're catching up uh, innocent workers and, and separating families. So when Trump was a candidate, uh, he talked about Mexicans being rapists, being uh, murderers, uh, being drug dealers. So this is kind of the campaign that he uh, ran on. And a lot of people, when he was talking about uh, boasting about sexually assaulting women and so on and so forth throughout the campaign, everything was like the last straw. But in, in my mind, it's like this was the first straw. This, is, this should have knocked them out of the campaign, but there's an audience for this, right? So there's, there's an audience that people believe the message because they want to believe it. So Trump is not converting anybody. He's just channeling what people believe in the first place. And in a way, I prefer somebody call me a wetback in front of my face than, than behind my back. Right? So the, uh, the idea here that Mexicans are characterized this way was a way for him to appeal to, to a certain work, white working class um, voter that, that is, feels disenfranchised and, and the, the frustrations are being misplaced. So here are, are, are a series of photos by a, a Mexican photographer, Antonio Turoc. He's a brilliant photographer, a world-renowned. And w when we're talking about Mexicans and we're, we're labeling them as drug dealers, what you don't want to do is get into this, well, I'm not a drug dealer, I'm a good one. I'm one of the good ones. Because you're buying into the, the narrative. It's like Nixon when he said, well, you're a crook. He said, well, no, I'm not a crook. When someone labels somebody something and you reject it in terms of, well, no, I'm not like that or I'm not one of those, then you're accepting that premise. Right? So I reject it altogether. When I look at immigrants, I don't, I don't look at immigrants. I look at human beings. To me, it doesn't matter. I was born here. My brother was born in Tijuana. I don't see a difference. I mean, I'm better looking than him, but I just don't see a difference. It doesn't, that, to me, that category is arbitrary. Before 1848, if you were here, you were a Mexican. Today, you know, you're an American. But to me, it's the same, it's, we're the same, it's the same people, same blood. So when I look at these people, I, 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 I think about, you know, family. I think about uh, unity. That's what I think about. Those are the characteristics, not these labels that, that we, we fall into. You know, I don't think about criminals. When I see a street vendor in the city of Los Angeles, the street vending is a crime. While they're taking away the criminal aspect in terms of like the misdemeanor charge, there's still a fine to it. They could pay up to like $250 and their goods are taken away like if they're selling crack. I mean, these ladies are selling tamales. They're not selling, you know, medical marijuana here, you people, you know. Not that I have anything, well... That's another story. So when I see a picture like this, I don't think about criminals. What I think about, that's a hardworking person. Because you have to get up like at 5 in the morning and get the, get the goods for, for the, the, 
the truck, the, the vending, whatever you're going to vent. And you have to prepare it. And then you have to transport it. And then after you're done, then you have to take it back. These are hard, honest, good working people. They have the values, the characteristics in terms of being family oriented, a strong work ethic, being an entrepreneur that this country needs. Because the more Americanized you get, the lazier you get as far as I'm concerned. And I can tell you that as a fact. <laughs> I was like the laziest American kid in the history of humanity. But an, Amer an, a, an immigrant at 16 years old, you don't have to tell that kid to do his bed. He'll make a bed, you know. But try to get an American kid to make their bed, you know. So this idea that the rapist, I mean, all these, all these labels, you know, once you start telling a lie over and over, people buy it, right? So we have to break the, the, this narrative, these false labels that, <clears throat> that the leaders, they're not my leaders, but the leaders of this country uh, are the ones that are perpetrating. So this idea of family values, today we don't see it as much, but a, a couple of years ago, like 10 years ago, there was the Republicans and the conservatives, they talked a lot about family values. They were like really big on this. That's why, they, that's why they, they're like against abortion, because like we're for family values. But if family values was like an Olympic sport, the Mexicans would be getting like a, a We'll be getting medals all the time, you know? Like gold medals, none of this silver and bronze. Because the Mexicans don't mess around when it comes to the family. It's not just the mom and dad, it's the abuelo y abuela, and, and it's compadre y comadre, padrino y madrina. There's like first cousin, second cousin, third cousin, we don't mess around. We can go to our nan's house, we just open the refrigerator, we don't have to ask, you know? There's no label like, oh, don't eat this for bread. No, they just open the, que de comer mi tía, you know, they, you go to any Mexican, you go to the poorest Mexican village, the poorest Mexican village, and you get there, and the first thing they'll do is they'll feed you. They won't even ask, are you hungry? They, they, they'll, just, they'll just put you a plate right there. And then you go visit another family member or another poor village, and they'll keep feeding you. It's like, all right, already. <laughs> and, but it's, it's, it's that family, for them, it's family. This idea of mi casa es tu casa. The problem is that they said that to the Americans and they took them literally. <laughs> but family is important to the Latino, just like it is to the Asian Americans, just like it is to the Filipinos and other groups. So there's also another false narrative that I want to attack here, and I will continue to attack until I get deported. This idea of racism being framed as like a black and white issue. And this idea that now we've seen racism framed like as a, a brown and white dichotomy. And this is a false dichotomy that we need to reject. You know, when I look at the students here at Cal Poly, they're very diverse. And whenever, whenever I speak at any, any university of this nature, I see like diversity and I see that diversity in being embraced. But I don't see the leaders of this country embracing that diversity. They're using that diversity to separate us. So there was a, a professor, uh, he passed away now at Harvard, uh, Sam, Samuel Hup, Huntington. He argued in this um, article he wrote, The Hispanic Challenge, he argued that Europeans were superior to the Latinos. And this idea of superiority, it goes way back to the late 1800s of the studies of eugenics, where the pseudoscientists, that's a SAT word, the pseudoscientists argue or try to argue that there was genetic differences between Europeans and Africans. Genetic differences between Europeans and Asians and Europeans and Mexicans. And it explained to them, they were trying to explain why is it that Europe was developing when other countries were, were not developing. So they try to get this idea, and this is where the, the IQ comes into place and all that. So they were trying to test it, the brain size, and they were trying to make sense of it from a racist premise. 
And there's, there's actually an idiot out there that, that got his PhD from Harvard. I'm starting to like, see Harvard as like, Jesus Christ, you know, what kind of people are you producing? Who wrote a dissertation and got approved by this Cuban-American professor, conservative, uh, George Borjas. And in his, in his thesis of his argument of his dissertation, he argued that he claimed that Mexicans were inferior to whites. And that's why we should exclude them. I mean, he literally, genetically speaking. And if you take a test genetically of everybody, of all races, we're all the same. There's no difference. There's genetic difference in terms of like family and in in certain regions and all that you can find. But like at the end of the day, we're all human beings. We're all the same. But this false narrative of whites being superior, you know, brown people being inferior. This culture here is advanced. This culture here is primitive. So there's this there's dichotomy. We need to reject that altogether. So this is a painting by my brother, uh, Salomon Huerta. He's a world famous uh, painter. He, he um, studied at Art Center College of Design, one of the best, or the best uh, schools of, of uh, design in terms of automobile. The, the main in designer of, uh, from Telsa, he, he's from Art Center, and then received his master's at uh, UCLA. But for me, looking at this painting, I want to make it clear that we need to see people for what they are. So for me, the, the idea of immigration is not, a, it's not just a political, or it's just not a scholarly interest, but it's also, at the end of the day, it's a personal. So here's a picture of, of my, um, my grandparents. It's right there, handsome man. And my grandma, so Martin Huerta, Antonia Huerta. Actually, Antonia's the name of my wife. And I didn't know this, but my cousin, it's kind of weird the way the world works. And he texts me a picture of a, a card where it showed that my, my grandfather was a member of the United uh, Farm Workers Union with uh, Cesar Chavez. I actually wrote an essay when my dad made Cesar Chavez. It's kind of funny. You should read it. And my grandfather was also part of the Bracero program. And... During the 60s, they, after the Bracero program ended, they stayed and they work as, as farm workers still. And my uncles and, and my father, so this was part of it. So speaking of my father, also another good looking guy here. He looks like somebody I know. Wait, let me. I need the gun though. As you can see here, he has a gun there. He don't mess around. Whenever he asked me for something, everything was like usted, mande usted. There was never two, you know. Alvaro, tráeme leche. ¿Qué? Alvaro, okay, papa. <laughs> See you, Ted. Yeah. So my mother, too, also a good-looking woman there. Um, look, look like a Hollywood couple. So they grew up in the 1930s in, in Michoacán, in Sajo Grande, a, a, small, um, a small rancho not about two hours away from, from Morelia. And they, they were like what Marx refers to as the peasant class. Uh, they were farmers, and they worked the land. And this is a picture of them in 1954. So speaking of even better looking people, the kid to the left, that's me. Uh, I should have been like a child model or something. Like, you know, that should have been my, I don't know what happened. And the guy to the right, the, the one to the, yeah, the, the right is, that's my brother, Salomon. Uh, so I was born in this country. My mother during the 1960s, and my father, my family, they migrated to Tijuana, to La Colonia Libertad, un uh, cañón um, and we were pretty much uh, dirt poor. And it wasn't just my, my parents, it was like my grandfather was, my grandparents' house was here, my, my Tio Javier, and then Tio Lupe, this is like, I have like 10 uncles and aunts. And so they were all, we all grew up like a, like a little village, and uh, we were all, when they say dirt poor, there's a reason why they call it dirt poor, because there's nothing but dirt there. Uh, but my mother, she had, um, she had a work permit, and my dad had a work permit too. You know, so when they came to the United States, everything was, was within the law. It doesn't matter to me, but that's, that's what it was. But in the, the work permit, you know, it didn't say you couldn't have kids here. You know? So my mom was really smart. She, 
she was the smartest woman I've ever met. And um, she decided one day when, when she was, con when she was, when I was conceived, she decided, well, one day when I'm working in San Diego, because she would go back and forth, I'll just happen to have Alvaro there, you know, like, by coincidence. Oh, what? <laughs> it's about time to give birth. So I'm just going to be on this side. Uh, so because of the, the comadre mafia, you know, one of my mom's comadres hook, hooked her up and took her to Sacramento. Uh, that's Sacramento for some of you. Uh, I don't want to make sure with the translation here. Get confused. Uh, so I was born in, in Sacramento, and then she decided once I was born, 40 days later, uh, ship me back to Tijuana. I was like, hey, we should stay here. There's air conditioning, mom. But I was little. I didn't have a choice. So for the first four years of my life, I, I spent in Tijuana. And we, we came back, and now that I was a citizen, and then, you know, I have eight brothers and sisters, uh, because I was a citizen, then they, they all can legalize their papers. And back then, it wasn't that difficult, actually. I charge them like 20% a year for the earnings, you know, because of me, you know. I'm what Republicans call an anchor baby. Uh, I don't know why I'm kind of thin, you know, I can't be really an anchor, you know. Maybe I put rocks in my pocket, I don't know, but they call me, that's what they call me. Whatever, I don't care. Uh, doesn't matter to me. I don't really care what people think about me anyway. But my mom, my whole family, first they moved to Hollywood. The, like, when I say family, like all of them, like in a three-story house. And then my mom got tired of, of all the cheese, man, too many people, blah, blah, blah. And then she decided to apply for public housing um, in East L.A. So this is where we really grew up. Um, starting, at, my brother, he was eight and I was six. And we went to... Uh, she so applied for public housing in East Los Angeles and in, in Ball Heights. It's called Ramona Gardens Housing Projects. But she was an immigrant. She didn't know any better. She didn't know that she applied to, the, to one of the most dangerous housing projects, as also known by, big, by the gang Big Hazard, in, in the West Coast. At one point, it was like the headquarters of a PCP uh, distribution uh, in, in Los Angeles. And, you know, I've always been thin all my life. And when my brother and I first got there, you know, I wasn't really like gang material. You know, I tried to apply for a gang, but it, my gang application got rejected. So like, so when we first got there, I was a little nervous because we were little and, and this group of kids were like waiting for us. You know, if you go to the white suburbs, you know, they go and they give you a basket of like a gift card to Starbucks and welcome to the neighborhood, you know. But there, the idea was they were gonna jump us into the gang or to invite us, like what kind of welcoming is that? <laughs> So my brother and I were, were outside. We, we didn't leave the house for like a month until we, we couldn't take it anymore. And then we had to go outside. And so they made my brother fight with somebody and I had to fight with somebody. But luckily when we were kids, our role models were, were Muhammad Ali and, and Bruce Lee, you know, cause there were no Mexican role models back then. And so my, my brother started throwing his Bruce Lee moves. He's like, oh. <laughs> so he scared the gang members. So they're like, okay, okay. And I started copying my brother too. So I'm like, oh, cause I didn't want to fight. You know? So that saved me, but um, there's a, a myth. There's a myth out there that me that Mexicans, Mexican immigrants, Mexican parents uh, don't value education. That's the biggest myth I've heard in my entire life. I mean, that's even worse than the other ones. And y'all can tell me if you're here. If you grew, if your parents grew up poor, if your parents were immigrants, if your parents had to drop out of high school, the first thing they tell you. And tell me if I'm lying, because sometimes I don't even know when I lie. The first thing that a parent tells you, apart from, you know, brush your teeth, is I want you to go to school. Because I don't want you to work like me. I don't want you to struggle like me. I don't want you to have two jobs like me. I don't want you to be sexually harassed like me. I don't want you to, to have those Limited opportunities, minimum wage. That's why any immigrant, any rational immigrant, any rational working class person, whether you're from Appalachia or you're from Pomona, that parent is going to tell their kid, do well in school, stay in school. You don't want to suffer like I did. And that's what my mom you know, said to me and my brother and my other siblings. And one of her, in one of her... <laughs> The way she was, one of her ideas was she told my dad, because after a while my dad kind of just retired, and 
he would he would watch uh, TV a lot, like Bonanza. He used to like Bonanza because it, it reminded him it's like a, it's a western of the the Wild West where he grew up. So one day my mom told my dad, "Hey, I want you to take uh, take Alvaro and Salomon to work as street as uh, day laborers." So they, they they know the value of labor. See, that's the the idea of the immigrant, because my mom was illiterate. So she's like, I'm going to teach them how to work hard. Like, thanks a lot, mom. <laughs> so she told my dad, and my dad was a macho. My dad didn't mess around, you know. He didn't take orders from anybody. But and then my mom said to, my, dad, my mom was better than my dad in terms of, like, she was, her will was stronger than him. She goes, if you don't take them, I'll take them. And then, I, and then my dad goes, okay, I'll take them. So one day we wake up. My dad wakes us up like at 5 in the morning, and w there we are. 5 in the morning, he wakes us up, and I'm thinking, like, Al-Qaeda's coming from us. Uh, like, like, why is he waking up at 5 in the morning? Because I was a lazy kid. I was gifted in math, and everything was well. I was doing fine in school. I don't know why my mom had this idea. But my dad took us two hours to Malibu to work as, as day laborers. And I didn't even know what a day laborer was back then. So I was, we were right there in the corner, and there was all these Mexicans. And a Mercedes would come by, and then a, a BMW. And then because I was good at math, I started to figure out, oh, they're picking up workers to work. And I kept, like, I was a Catholic back then. I was, please don't pick me up. I was, like, praying. You know, I had the rosario and everything. And they picked us up. And then they took us to work. And then, you know, I was being thin all my life. So, like, for me, like, just doing my bed, I, got, I would get tired, you know, like, Blanket was kind of heavy. So there I am, like, pulling weeds. And I'm pulling weeds, and then my, not the kind you smoke, just the, the other weeds. I'm pulling weeds. And then, like, it was like when I used to go to Catholic church, I was, like, pulling weeds, and I used to look at my watch. Like, when is this going to be over, you know? And I kept looking, you know, like, when is this over? And then my dad goes, okay, okay. And then I get up, and I go, okay, okay, let's, it's time to go. He goes, no, it's break time. I was like, oh, my God, it's like two hours went by and I thought it was like a whole day went by and then okay I keep doing like pulling weeds that's all I had to do pull weeds and then two hours later it's like okay okay Alvaro and then I go oh yeah we gotta go <laughs> I was all happy I was excited the Lakers were playing he goes no it's lunch time and I had like the burrito that my mom made me you know like when you're Mexican you have to hide the burrito especially back then you know because you're embarrassed I had the burrito she made me and then I was eating it and I, as I was eating it like tears were coming down my eyes you know and my hands were, like, really, like, weak, and I couldn't hold the burrito, you know. And then I, I started, like, saying to myself, I started saying to myself, uh, I'm too lazy for this, man. I'm going to go to college. So that's what I did. So I ended up uh, going to Occidental College uh, at Upper Bound. It's a program for high school kids that come from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, I, we, we were there, I applied in 10th grade, so from 10th, 11th, uh, you spend six weeks in residential, so they teach you about going to college, uh, because nobody in my family went to college, nobody even graduated high school, so my brother and I graduated elementary school, we were like on the top of the world, we were like, yeah, we made it, mama, you don't have to work anymore. Uh, so for the first time, people that looked like me were telling me, you too can go to college, and because of that, uh, that belief in me, you know, I was always gifted in math, so that, that made it easy. Uh, but the reading and writing was, was not up to par because I went to terrible public schools in, in East Los Angeles. Uh, but because of that program, you know, I ended up getting my, my bachelor's and master's in urban plan uh, bachelor's in history at UCLA and master's in, in, in urban planning at UCLA. And then a PhD at, at UC Berkeley considered, you know, the number one public university in, in the world, you know, by many. Um, you know, but for me, it's not just about academics. Uh, what I try to do is, when I was at UCLA uh, back in the day, uh, I was a student activist. There I am right there. The guy, the handsome one with the sarape. Even when I see that guy, he's, oh, that's a good looking dude. Uh, so I was a student radical um, and an activist in, in Mecha. We had a hunger strike in, in um, November 19th through the November 11th through the 19th in 1987 to support undocumented students. The university was taking away their financial aid. But it's not just about uh, organizing at the community level, but also organizing at, at the campus, at the, commu 
It's not just about organizing at the, at the college level, but also at the community level. So here I was an organizer, help organize gardeners, uh, Latino gardeners in Los Angeles uh, with the Association of Latin American Gardeners Los Angeles, and also working uh, as a community organizer against a power plant in Southgate. And now as a professor, as a public policy expert, uh, I advocate for, for people uh, that are disadvantaged, for los de abajo. You know, and for me, it's not just a question about Latinos uh, or Mexicans. It's about any group. You know, any attack on one individual is an attack on all individuals. We see now today, for example, how uh, sexual assault is, is being reported. I mean, it's been reported uh, from day one, but for, for the first time, we're seeing how the voices of women are being heard and men are being held accountable, all those perverts out there. Uh, in terms of, of, of sexual assault taking place in the workplace. Uh, but for me, it's a question of defending, you know, the, the women, the, the Latinas, African Americans, and another group that's being attacked by this administration, Muslims. You know, I'm an atheist. I should not be defending any religious group. Um, I'm, it's a, goes against my atheist uh, principles. I think I'm going to be kicked out of the club because of this. You know, my membership club is going to be revoked. But I don't think it's right. You know that somebody just because they believe in something that they should be you know banned from this country uh that one is unconstitutional two uh it, it, it's that type of discrimination is unacceptable so i believe that everybody has the right to believe in some believe in a higher being and also have the right not to believe and nobody should be persecuted for for either case uh so what should we do you know one is you should buy my book uh, it's $15, two for 30. This is special today. Uh, and then this book pretty much solves all your problems. You know, your life, you'll see enlightenment because of it. It's like the Dalai Lama, reading the Dalai Lama, I'm up there. And people should resist. People should organize. And sometimes students don't realize that you have more power than you think you have. Students were the ones in, in 64 at Berkeley that started the free speech movement. Students were the ones that, that stopped the war in Vietnam. You know, students were the ones that were critical to end apartheid in South Africa, which was the racist system taking place. They were, students were the ones that, that freed Nelson Mandela. Any, anything that has taken place throughout history, students, young people like yourselves, have been the main engine of change. So in my estimate, you know, what we face today, my generation and the one that preceded me pretty much failed all of you. So not to put any pressure on you, but the fate of the world depends on all of you here in this room. I believe in young people and I believe in diversity and I believe that the young people in this room and, and those watching on YouTube just click once because I get a dollar are better are more acceptance of differences, are more progressive minded, you know, discriminate less, they don't self-segregate based on race, religion, or class. So I think those characteristics that, that young people have today, what they call like the millennials, I think those values are gonna take us forward. And that's the only hope that I have in uh, moving forward because I don't have hope in the current administration or even on Obama's administration, given his record of, of deporting 2.7 million immigrants and, and killing people by drones in the Middle East. So my faith is in young people. My faith is in people like yourselves. Uh, and you need to resist. You need to organize. Do so uh, peacefully and, and make a difference in this world. So for me, uh, speaking here today, in this presentation, I dedicated I dedicate it to my brother, Noel Huerta. Thank you. Muchas gracias. So we have about five minutes of questions. Um, so if somebody wants a question. Come on, people, not all at once. A question, comment, compliment, something. 
Like, oh, that was a brilliant, you know, my world has changed now. Where can I buy your book? Oh. We have to do this because we're at Cal Poly. We could only afford one mic. How long um, over the years, like, did you study immigration and stuff to have, like, this much knowledge and to, like, speak up about it? But well, that's a great question. So we're going we're gonna to start with that question, and we'll end with that question. Um, I started, because this is a great question. I started, I, actually, I, gave him the, I text him, like, ask this question here. <laughs> How come you're so smart? Text. <laughs> uh, is it genetic? When I was, when I, I studied history at UC, first I was, at UCLA, I was a math major. Remember I said I was gifted in math, so that was my thing. But I wasn't prepared in the reading and writing. I wasn't at the college level. So when I got to UCLA, the reading and writing, I was not prepared. So it was like a culture shock for me. Because in my high school, I only read one book, The Pearl, 60 pages. Luckily, there was a lot of books. And I was only assigned one two-page paper. That's it. It was like quadruple space or something like that. So after UCLA, and then I got into community organizing, and then I went to urban planning. And then when I got to, um, to Berkeley with a PhD, I didn't even want to study immigration. I wanted to study um, like social movements, community organizing, things like that. But back then, it was, there was no, I mean, Trump was always around and with his buffoonery, with his dad, you know, in the 70s, 70s discriminating against black people in, in their housing. So that orange man in the White House was always around. But there were other congressmen, other leaders attacking Mexicans, like Sessions, for example, the Attorney General. So when I was doing my PhD, I started to write, a, I, start to, I, start to org, I start to do research on immigration on the side. And then I start to focus what I was doing instead of organizing, include immigration in it. And then I start to look and I start to write like social commentaries for the progressive, Counterpunch and other groups. And then even some of my advisors from Berkeley and then some from UCLA, I don't they, they just told me, they didn't even ask, they just kind of give me advice, unsolicited advice. What they were saying is like, Alvaro, oh, don't focus on that too much. Don't focus on social commentaries. Don't worry about what's happening in the world. Just do your dissertation. But I felt like this moral imperative, it's like, near, you know, like Neo, like in the, the Matrix, you know, I felt like I'm the chosen one because I look around and I see nobody's speaking out on, when they're attacking Mexicans, nobody's do doing anything. Like, what good is having a mayor that's Mexican if they don't speak out on behalf of, of Mexicans or a congressman or, or what have you? So that was kind of where I was coming from. So I started to study it more. I started to write about it more. You know, in, you know while I was doing my dissertation and focusing on social commentaries that were published, you know, nationwide and internationally, you know, even The Hill and, and, um, and other ones. So with that, it's, it's been about, like, in terms of studying it and writing about it, we're looking about 10 years. Um, but I think at the end of the day, my strength is, is, is not just the academics, but also, like, live, living through it. So when you live, when you study something and you, are, you also lived it, it gives you that strength. It gives you like an additional level of understanding. Right? So like if you're a woman and you're studying about women issues, you're going to have a better understanding of what you're studying than a man studying about like women issues. Right? Like what do men know? You know? Bunch of dummies, you know? So having that background, to me, it helped me in my understanding. So when I read an article or a book, or when I review books and articles about immigration, I read it and I say, wow, that, that doesn't make sense to me. Because that's, that's not how I experienced it and that's not how my family and my neighbors and, and so on and so forth, right? So that kind of gives me th that, that inside, outside perspective. And also when I study poverty because I grew up poor and, and, and then these other aspects, you know. But what I advocate for young people and also for other people, like my colleagues, wherever they're at, because they need education too, because I feel obligated to educate them as well, because they didn't go to Berkeley, is that study something that you're passionate about. Because that will make you a better student, that will make you a better scholar. I don't see students as like students, I see you as young scholars.
And over time, you'll get to wherever you want to get to. So my brother's world-famous painter, he's exhibited all over the world in New York, Winnie Baño, and Gogation, the world's richest gallery in Italy, in Germany, in Mexico City. But he's been doing it for like 20 years. So at first, it's not that good, but then over the years, with training and discipline, then you're going to get better. But, but you have to stick with it. And you have to be passionate about it, whatever, whatever you select. So whether it's immigration or you're looking at housing or you're looking at anything that has to do with what I consider the public good, like doing, being good and doing good. Not just as planners, but as people that study ethnic studies, as architects, as anybody, you know, to make a difference in the world. And to give yourself more credit than, than sometimes people will give you credit for. I believe in, in, in all of you, except for those of you that missed class yesterday. No, I'm just kidding. You know, I believe in all of you. So all you need is two people. You believe in yourself and me believe in you. Because sometimes you have parents that don't even believe in you. That's it. That's all you need, two people. And you just focus on what you got to focus on and, and stick to it regardless of what people say. Unless it's drugs or something like that, right? What well, Dr. Huerta says, stick to it. I like drugs. I'm going to stick to it, you know. You know, like, you know, you know, he said, you know. And you become, at first, you're a novice. At first, you're just kind of like making stuff up. At first, you're making a lot of mistakes. But over the years, you get better and better. And then, you know, you, you, you become an expert. You know, for, so for me, I think my expertise is not just about immigration, but it's, it has to do with, like, being, being there for people when I didn't have that, you know. Like, didn't have that somebody to encourage me at that level. Not like my mom and dad were always encouraging. They, everything I want to do, they let me do it. Like, if I wanted to join the gang, okay, Mijo, go, 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 you know, go join the gang. You know, they, they pretty much let me do, my brother, whatever we wanted to do. But when you get to the university, it's different because they don't, they don't know how to help you. So now you need people that are professors, people that have gone through it to help you, right? And that, that's kind of, for me, that's, that's more important than anything else. Right? So I don't want... Y'all, like my parents and immigrants say to, to their kids, I don't want all of you to suffer like I did. All right, muchas gracias.